I am Bill Cortright with Living Right with Bill Cortright. And this is the Stress Mastery Podcast, where we take you from the science to the spirituality of stress mastery. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Stress Mastery Podcast. I am your host, Bill Cortright, and I am here with the super millennial, David Barreto, giving us the millennial perspective. How are you doing today, Dave? I'm doing good. I'm trying to get. How you doing today, Dave? <laughs> <I'm> good. <laughs> so, so are you doing all right? Yeah, it's going good. You ready? Yeah, it's it's time. It's almost time, right? So you're going to get ready. So next week, we you're going to do a podcast. You said on Monday next week, right? Yeah, I'm going to do a, a kind of you know a brief introduction into the throwbacks that we're going to do, and uh, I'm I'm, I'm going to take a moment before I go into. Uh, you know, my experience. So I can kind of recap it when I do get back and we do have a conversation what I'm going through before. And then if it matches any of the thoughts, feelings, emotions, expectations, whatever's going on. Very cool. So this week we've been talking about becoming organized. So today's Connection Thursday, we're going to discuss how decluttering can aid your personal growth and even become a spiritual practice. You ever think of decluttering as a spiritual practice, cleaning the garage? Uh, no, but no, I, I say, think so. <laughs> so. So let's talk about it. So becoming organized for many is about decluttering their lives. Research shows that clutter has an effect on our anxiety levels, sleep, and our ability to focus. It has been found that clutter can make us less productive, which activates the red zone coping methods and then we experience avoidance strategies, and this drives behavior to snack on junk food, binge watch television, or get lost for hours on our social media. So clutter locks in the state of restriction-based energy fear. Here, clutter depletes your energy, but also wastes your precious resource of time. As you are disorganized in the search looking for lost items like keys, glasses, your favorite shirt, wallets, important papers, the list grows larger and larger. This is connected and it expands to the amount of clutter you hold in your environment. So one thing I try to do, <laughs> I'm pretty anal about where I put everything, right? Mm -hmm. Clutter doesn't work well for me. How about yourself? Uh, before I used to uh, kind of live in clutter and it, it's, it's interesting because now, um, the more clutter I have, the more I have to just stop. Like, I don't let it get to that point anymore because it just, it bothers me so much. And here's why. Clutter, as we're going to discuss today, can block your energy, your spiritual connection, even your personal growth. So ask yourself this question. When you look around your home, do you feel like a heavy weight on your shoulders? Does it feel like you need room to breathe? Do you feel trapped? This is because instead of open space and flowing energy, your closets, your drawers, your cupboards, maybe even your sink is full of dishes. And with all of this filled to the brim with junk from your past, you start to stifle the energy. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's not just stuff. When you sit and open your laptop, do you feel overwhelmed instead of being ready to create and grow? This is because you have old emails, disorganized files, and dozens of apps open. You can see how that affects people's energies. Yeah. Now, your current reality is set through your behavior and routine, which is driven by the programmed identity ego. So let's take a look at what clutter can reveal. Clinical psychologist Noah Mankowski, an expert in hoarding, states, the way you perceive your clutter is the way you perceive yourself and your relationships. He adds, where we put our clutter usually corresponds to different emotional events. According to Mankowski, if you have a lot of stuff in the attic or the basement, this may indicate you have an inability to let go of the past. A cluttered bathroom may indicate and reveal body image issues. Clutter in a living room suggests blockages in your social life as well as your relationship with yourself. A cluttered bedroom might relate to issues surrounding your sexual self, 
fears of intimacy or gender roles. So have you ever thought of that? It's like, it's interesting when you start to really start to break it down because there's always a reason we do everything. Mm -hmm. That's what I find fascinating about the human being. There's always a reason for behavior. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, like, I, like I've mentioned in uh, one of the podcasts this week that, you know, as I went into a, a depressive state, I've noticed, you know, certain things, dishes piling up, uh, you know, laundry hasn't wasn't getting done and things like that. Just the small things that I just thought I was sure. able to fatigue with. But when I'm not in that mood or that energy, it's it's one of those like, no, it won't even get that point. Or like I said, it would bother me and I wouldn't allow it to happen. That's always telling you, you see, you got to kind of read energy and it's telling you that your energy is open, you know. So let us dive in a little deeper into clutter and how decluttering can actually become a spiritual practice for your personal growth and enhance your, your personal development. So if you slow down and recall a time when you made a decision to clean up, get rid of stuff in a room, in your house, this this could have been a closet, a bedroom, um, a home office, a garage, anything that was cluttered. Think back. When you had finished the job and you looked at the area over what you have just completed in, how did you feel? And most will feel an energy of peace, calm, joy, fulfillment. And this is what happens when we declutter and we open the universal energies to flow. Can you remember a time, even cleaning out your car, right? People's cars get cluttered. And when you clean it out, you feel differently. Everything is energy. What are your thoughts on that? You know, the one that I re recently mm -hmm. discovered that gives me like the most, like almost like clarity and feels like re-energized when I declutter the fridge. When I go through things that I'm not using, especially like sauces, have you seen how many sauces people have that they just don't use? Now I know I have my, my few and like it makes it a lot easier going in. And it's a small thing like that. Most people don't even think about. But for me, I was the same way. Now I like it organized. I like knowing what it is. And if it's not necessary, toss it out. Like the leftovers people have for sure. weeks and weeks and weeks. It's like eat clutter. Have you ever tried to work out in a cluttered gym? Yeah, with equipment laying all over the place and can't find a way. The dumbbells are different. Like, oh God, yeah. How's that energy feel? Uh, it's it, you feel all over the place. You kind of feel chaotic. Off. Yeah, it's chaotic. You know, so people don't realize this. See, we begin to declutter our lives. Most often, it's because we are longing for some kind of peace, maybe some space, some relief from chaos, or. Perhaps we declutter so we can open up our creative energies to start a new project or even a new chapter in our lives. Now, if you get into the process of decluttering instead of just doing to clean it up, something magical happens. You can start to learn about yourself. This is a powerful spiritual practice if you find the now and declutter in being and process versus doing and result. Mm -hmm. So not only are we going to get ready for the new year, I want you to declutter your lives, but I don't want you to declutter for the sake of cleaning up. I want you to declutter for the sake of your personal growth. Decluttering, getting organized can cause you actually to confront some key relationships with that stuff you have. <laughs> it's a relationship with your stuff. So as a practice, number one, we can learn that clutter often represents being stuck in the mid-red zone energy fear. So think about that mid-red zone energy. We can see ourselves procrastinating and the avoidance patterns of having to do it right? You can actually feel, we put things off, I'll do it tomorrow. And we find that if we address the clutter, we will address resistance. You're not going to, you know, it's cluttered because you didn't want to do it, right? Yeah. It's cluttered for a reason. So when you address it, you have to address the resistance. And again, as we know, this is a spiritual practice. You grow through conflict. Resistance is conflict. Your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I think it's it's funny because that's uh that's one of those big procrastination things that you're like, oh, if I get to it, I get to it. When I was younger, my dad and, and my mom would always say, if you do a little bit all the time, you won't have to do it so much, you know? And by the time it got so much of a wreck, you're just like, oh, it's too much. It's going to take too much time. So you keep putting it off, putting it off. And it's always in the back of your head. You know, when you come home from a vacation, your, your house is spotless. Like, imagine coming home and then seeing a wrecked house. What mood are you instantly going to go into, you know? And so when you start the decluttering process, you're going to feel resistance and it gives you an opportunity to bring the conflict to resolution. Allow the conflict to activate and pass through. Don't bitch while you're doing it because yeah. then you're in doing. You want to be in being. We're creating practices, you know. And when I'm done with this, everybody, I'm going to give you my address. You can come over and clean my house because <laughs> I'm trying to help you as a teacher. You know, that's how I solicit help, just so you know. <laughs> you ever wonder why so many people come in and clean my house? That's why. It's a spiritual <laughs> practice. So, number two. As a practice, we can become aware that we place a lot of power in our objects. The power that we put into our stuff, it's the power to give us identity and a sense of value, a sense of who we are. Our stuff ties us to our identity. So you want to look at stuff, you know, the stuff that you're you're moving, you're, you're getting. Why do you have it? Mm -hmm. And how does it represent you? Because you own it. So why do you own it? How does that feed my, again, you're turning this into a practice. How does it feed? How, how is this feeding this and, or that? Your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's interesting going into a, a time period, especially when like moving or, you know, spring cleaning and you find things that you haven't used in forever, or it shows you like a version of you from the past that kind of you're stuck yes. to. It's like, you haven't done this or like when people are like, archery painting something that they've never picked up in years they're attached to it because that was them in the past especially like when they haven't they want to but they haven't and they feel like yep. that's that last time piece of them and they don't it, want to move on and again you bring that into awareness it's powerful number three as you declutter be very aware of what items you are letting go of why did you buy this in the first place why did you keep it? And why are you letting it go now? Mm -hmm. And all of this sounds like a silly little, little game because life is a silly little game. And when you do this, it just is revealing and it's freeing that you can let things go. So I just did this recently. And then I go to a meeting and there's the super millennial wearing one of my old shirts from the rock. Yeah. Because <laughs> you fit in my clothes now. The medium. Yeah, so, so it's so funny to watch you wearing it it's like i remember i used to own that shirt now why did i let it go why does this you know what what happens what happened to that identity that loved that shirt because you got a little bigger you put on some muscle you know i, said, I, don't, I don't know it's like those are things that are, are good this is contemplation people this is a powerful one thing that dan taught me my mentor taught me was all about contemplation he, he taught me meditation, but his big thing wasn't meditation. It was Remember, he was a stoic. Contemplation, contemplation, contemplation. Look at your behavior and question it. Mm -hmm. Because the moment you question your behavior, you're climbing the mountain. Number four, as we realize our original attachment, for instance, to those shoes, that purse, those pants, that statue of two dogs, whatever, ask yourself, did this thing, this item, make me happy? Did it make me happy when I had it? And then what happened? Did it bring you happiness? Did it bring you joy? You had it. It's your item. You're cleaning it out. You're cleaning out your closet. You're cleaning out these shoes. You're cleaning out these. What happened? When did it stop making you happy? You see how this is a very revealing exercise when you do it properly. And number five, now look closely at what is activated because as you go through and you start cleaning things i was just downstairs seeing what linda had one of her shows on right and they were cleaning out their garage for a yard sale and 
the guy goes, yeah, I look at this stuff and it brings back memories and I can't get rid of it. And why can't he get rid of it? If he does, what's activated? The regret program. Mm -hmm. It activates you. Do you feel any guilt for the clutter or guilt that you're going to let something go? Do you feel guilt about procrastinating and dealing with it? How about regret over the mindless shopping over the years where you just bought a bunch of stuff to buy stuff? So you're turning, what you're doing is you're turning your decluttering project into a spiritual or personal development awakening. And it can be fun and it can be enlightening. It really can. Mm -hmm. So let's discuss one of the ego's strongholds when it comes to clutter that really locks people into the red zone valley. And that stronghold is attachment. As you declutter, it's an amazing awareness process to ask why we acquired this stuff or this item and why we hold on to it in attachment. What is it that makes us hold on to these things? And here are some of the reasons we get attached to stuff. Now, always remember, it's the ego that gets attached, making your stuff part of the identity. You understand that, right, David? Yeah. So, number one, why we get attached is the want of security. See, buying a lot of stuff makes people feel secure. Even if it's a good deal, they justify buying something they really don't need and they'll buy a lot of it because it was on sale. It was a good deal. That's your mom mm. and your brother. <laughs> yeah. Am I right or am I wrong? Absolutely. If she listens to this episode, you told me to say that before we got yeah. on the air. <laughs> Think about it. Now, if everything crashes and the world falls apart and we have another pandemic, at least we have all this stuff. There are people who still have toilet paper from the pandemic, <laughs> right? This is the idea that we have to have things because that's lack. The want of security brings in the lack program. And there's another, this idea from my grandparents' generation. Remember, Programs are passed from generation to generation, but the generation that lived through the Great Depression, they're always in this belief you have to have like an emergency fund, um, emergency, you know, can of peas, emergency can of spam, emergency. But understand, having possessions isn't the best way to have security. It's the understand the want of security is never ending because. If you want it, that means you need it. And it's the more you need more to feel secure. You're in want. For me, as I age, I understand security is within. It's always going to be within. And so it allows me to be courageous and try some new things and do some new things. It's the ability to move into awareness versus reaction. See, I believe as I get older, I want to stay lean, downsize. I think that's a smart thing to do. I try to teach you kids the same thing. You know, buying more property or houses and increasing debt doesn't bring security. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. understand how to explain it to people. You know, real estate probably isn't the best thing to, to, to do if you want, <laughs> want security. Why? Because it's not an asset. You have a 30-year mortgage. You have a debt. You know, now in some cases with Angie and, and Kevin, they have kids. Yes. Yeah. My house. You know what I mean? You're, you're building your family stuff. But mm -hmm. do you understand when it comes to hoarding or saying you need more or you have to have this so you can feel safe, you, you'll never feel secure. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think the when when people do that, they, that's the plan B, you know, always in the back of the head. I think that's always like setting B. yourself up for either failure or disaster coming up. And just so you can feel safe to have a safety net. But I think that that provides like a, a false sense of security and comfort that comes along with it. It does. And when you have comfort, you have, you, you, you have mm -hmm. uh, stalledness, right? You're stalled. That's what happens. So after the pandemic, a lot of people had to go into their 401k and had to go in here, had to go in there. Where was your security? Yeah. You know, and now you're, now you're stuck instead of, okay, I, I'm, you got comfortable when you could say, okay, I got five sources of income. Oh, I got one knocked down. This one will fill that. You see how it works, right? Yeah. So number two is the want of approval. Now, very important. If we get honest, and remember, I always talk about being honest because the ego and that program identity is a liar, always lying, right? Even to yourself. 
if you're honest with yourself, you will see that you buy things to impress people. I used to love to pull my Corvette up to a red light and just have people gawk at it. I loved it. Right? That car was, when it first came out, that was car. It still is beautiful. Right? People will not admit they do this, but many buy things so they can be seen and get approval. Maybe it's a nice house. David, I had one house that the backyard looked like its own resort. It had a pool, had a pool house, had a game room, had a basketball court, and a tennis court, and it had two different barbecues. You've known me for 11 years, David. How often do I barbecue? I don't think I've ever seen you barbecue. <laughs> exactly. I had two barbecues. I want you to think about that for a second. It's, it's I'd ridiculous. Eat <laughs> yes, you would. But I, you know me. Yeah. I, I, you know, so many times we buy things that are popular, like the people with the with the big push for the tennis shoes, right? The big thing, Jordans. How many pair of Jordans does Brett have? Like fifty. You know. Yeah. And it's always like, well, they're worth something. Well, they're this, okay, but still. You have 50 pairs of shoes when you're moving around. It's so easy to transport those, right? People have to have the huge TV, the gaming equipment, and all those other things. We get that so we have approval, so we feel part of something, so we can show others, look at us, we're successful. And then when you look at the minimalism, in the end, we want to be more minimum than anyone else. (laughs) So it's all about getting seen, the want of approval. And the truth is, when we stop looking outside for approval, we actually begin to really like ourselves. In fact, we might even love ourselves. We don't have to win or compete with another. We live in process. So what are your thoughts on that is how we get end up with a lot of stuff? Yeah, I think it, it, it starts with like, you know, trying to mimic somebody else. I think that's like, especially now. Um, cause before you would see like for me, for the car stuff where it started, I remember clearly reading the, the magazines my dad used to get for all the car things and stuff like that. And then it transformed into like Instagram, right? I became the car that other people looked at and to, in the beginning, it's exciting. It's all that. But then when it becomes all like consuming to it, I remember changing up different colors all the time just to stay relevant. In that sense, and I end up having parts and parts and parts and parts and parts, and I wouldn't even use it. But at that point, it was it no, it was no longer for me. And that kid that saw the magazine was excited for cars. It was when I change something, I get more attention. When I do this, I get more attention. So that's the part where I think, like, when you accumulate stuff that you thoroughly enjoy and you use, and you know, stuff like that, that's completely different. It's when it transforms into that outside. What can it do for me? Or if I have this, I can brag about having it, even though you yep. haven't used it, touched it, saw it in years. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. Number three is comfort. Just the act. Now, this is how we end up with a lot of stuff we never use. It's just the act of buying things. It can be a way of, you know, comforting ourselves. It's shopping therapy. We've all heard of it, right? It's similar to comfort food. It really is. In this state, we buy stuff to to buy stuff, and many of these items become a source of our clutter. Now, dealing with this is about taking that pause. In other words, if you're doing that and you're just going to buy stuff because it makes you feel better, you have to pause and ask, what conflict, what problem, what situation am I avoiding? This pause can save you a lot of money and a lot of time. Mm-hmm. So if you do shopping to ease your stress, you are going to have clutter and you are going to knock down your energy. It's just the way it works, right? Mm-hmm. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that the the constantly buying things, I think people think it's weird that I, I like, you know, my same type clothing, make it simple, make it this. There's a lot of reasons why a lot of these overly successful people wear the same types of clothes and like very minimalistic things because they're not there to impress anybody. They're not there to overthink. It's just to keep it simple and keep that mind clear. And I think those people understand it and you would think the opposite 
you're super rich. Why don't you wear these clothes and this and that? Because it doesn't mean anything like that. And so like something like Steve Jobs is kind of uh, misunderstood because he wore the same thing, but it was really nice. Mm-hmm. They're really expensive jeans, really expensive sweater. It doesn't mean, you know, nice. It means it doesn't have a lot of things. It doesn't have 15 sweaters of a different color. You know, it's it keeps it basic. It doesn't mean it's not nice. It's keeping it basic, right? Yeah. And then we can talk about what creates clutter. Number four is identity and value. Possessions can give us a sense of identity and value. Um, an expensive watch tells the world you are successful. A trophy makes us feel accomplished. Lots of books make us feel smart. And I ask that question. How many of you listening have books that you own that you have never read? How much space are they requiring? Mm -hmm. So you can see how the true value is not found outside but within. But you can see how we buy things. You know, here's the last one that I love. Number five, we create clutter and buy things and get a lot of stuff through because of hope. How many people listening have exercise or sports equipment that they've never used, but hope they will one day use them in the future? Mm-hmm. Right? It's all the time. How many have hiking equipment but never go on hikes? But you hope to. Look around at the objects you don't use but might use in the future. Hope is for our future self, but if you realize you're complete in this moment, you just might get rid of those VCR tapes. Remember the tapes of Sweating with the Oldies with Richard Simmons? You might get rid of them. (laughs) And while you're at it, you might get rid of the VCR player too. (laughs) You know, I, you laugh, but this is the truth. It's the truth. This is what, this is, this is what people do. So when we, when we look at all the things it comes down to, we go out and we buy things because we believe this is going to make us happy, right? We're looking for happiness. We're always searching for fulfillment. We want to feel good. We're, we're, it's okay, you know? Mm-hmm. But in the end, we buy stuff because we're seeking that happiness and we have the belief that those new sneakers will look great when we go to the gym. A membership we paid for the last three years have gone three times. But if we get those sneakers, then we'll go to the gym. The new workout outfit. The new shirt will make me look great and I'll feel more successful and get out of my funk. The new book I just got will give me the answers to fix my life. You know, the new bag will make me so happy when I can get and show it to all my girlfriends. Now, when we search for happiness and fulfillment and joy outside ourselves, it's always a dead end. The expectations that the new sneakers would motivate me to exercise fall short. Your friends barely notice the new bag. You have been too busy and stressed out to read that new book that will change your life. It's it's the, it's the way when we look at human behavior, you got to laugh at yourself. The human being is a freaking idiot half the time and you got to laugh at yourself. A lot of these stories are about me, <laughs> right? I got those watches. I got that car. I had that house. I just like, it's just, when you look at it, it's like, God, you're, you're just a moron. What are you doing? <laughs> you know, but after a while you can turn this into a practice. The opening the universe is about what we discussed yesterday. What is it? It's connection to that green zone mind. Understand clutter prevents this connection. Attachment prevents this connection. Seeking happiness outside ourselves prevents this connection. Becoming organized for me has the single purpose to have this green zone mind connection. This connection to this limitless force of the heart. And so you've got to kind of ask what you're, what you're going for, right? So if you're doing your decluttering and you kind of look at yourself, and you ask the questions is, who bought that? Who had that? Why did I buy that? What was I going for when I did buy this? And why am I holding on to it? Why am I got all this crap in my garage, all this stuff, stuff in my closet? Why does Linda have 45 pairs of tennis shoes? And she always wears the same pair. Am I exaggerating? I played the fifth. 
<laughs> what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it was one that I actually did not too long ago, um, which I realized that it was more of a, a fear thing for me. Looking back, now that I don't fit none of my clothes, I realized I was keeping a few pair of pants that I would go back to and like use it as, oh, I'm so proud. I went from this to this. And I realized that every time I would like see them and things like that, it was kind of driving me almost in fear to not screw up and not do this. And I, I never thought about it until after I saw it. And I was like, I got to keep going. I got to keep going. And at first I thought it was a good thing. I thought it was like a motivation thing. You know, you see them, you're like, oh, I came so far. But I also realized that that was me trying to scare myself into continuing versus knowing I'm going to continue. So I, I got rid of it. I don't have nothing. That's from what then. you that's what you should do. I always tell people, especially for weight loss, if you're going down in sizes and you want to take control of the ego and the, and the subconscious, get rid of your clothes. Because they're gone. And what you're doing is, that's burning the bridges. That's mm -hmm. saying there is no plan B. I'm not going to gain the weight back. I'm not yeah, doing this. That's you the making a statement. There's my fat pants. Yes. You know, I don't have any. That's why you got my stuff. <laughs> because all that stuff doesn't fit me anymore. So, so I, since I went into competition, I'm not gaining the weight back. I'm holding it where I'm at. Yeah. So I actually wear a small. I know people freak out. They don't believe me, but I do. <laughs> You know, because I have to have a tight shirt. That's what Linda always says. <laughs> sexy, you know, what she call me? Sexy Santa. So <laughs> that's what that's what it is. So really it comes down to what's important in your life. As you do this exercise, enjoy it, the process. Really look at yourself. And I will give you a secret to transformation. You got to laugh at yourself. You got to laugh at yourself. You can't get mad at yourself. You can't punish yourself. You can't, you can't get down on yourself. You can't yell at yourself. It's just awareness. Laugh at yourself. And then really what is important, like for me now, what's important to me is meaningful work that serves my purpose and humanity as a whole. That's important to me now. Not going out and having that $30,000 watch, not having two barbecues that I've never barbecued a day in my life, right? That stuff's not important to me. What's important to me is my work is connected to my purpose. And it's, and it's really, it ignites me. I was, before we got on the record, I was working on a new book and I was developing the characters and I go to Linda, I go, so this character has how many kids? And so she says, we got three kids. Well, it's not us, Linda, <laughs> you know? So it was fun. We named the kids. We named that we're creating the characters. I've never written a book like this. So is it hard? Yes. Because I have to learn how to use emotions and, and make things. But it's fun. I'm having a good time doing it. And that's meaningful work. It serves my purpose and it serves my soul's mission. And then the second one is that's important to me is my loved ones. It really is. And, and that's Linda. It's you guys, the kids. Um, it's the grandkids. It's the dogs. But it's also those I work closely with are my clients. It's different than it used to be. You know, I'm not one that has a lot of friends, but the people that are in my life, I care deeply for. That, that ignites me. It gets me going. I don't have to go. And they don't care what I drive. They don't care what I wear. You know, it ignites me. And then the last one, really, I, I would say the most important thing to me is living the process. Uh, raising my consciousness, living mindfully, you know, finding the now, because that's really conflict resolution. Sitting there and working, it's, it's a beautiful energy to be in. So I would say the most important thing for me is my energy, is my consciousness, not my, oh, I feel good, I'm going to go work out energy. <laughs> because sometimes I can have high level of consciousness and still be tired. The difference now is, I allow myself to be tired when I used to think it was a badge of honor never to be tired. I don't have that identity anymore. You understand? That's what's important to me. So if you ask yourself, Dave, what would you say is important in your life now? Right. Right now, I, I realized that, you know, making things functional and enjoyable. I, I've, mm -hmm. I've learned that I've made things way too difficult because one, like I've said on, on Monday, I wasn't the most organized person. I realized that created a lot of unnecessary stress that was kind of like background noise that I didn't know was stress. 
now when things are starting to get cluttered or unorganized or not functional, I could see the amount of stress. And then that's also when I, when I talk to friends or Vanessa and things like that, it's like, I try to explain it and they don't see it. And I remember not being able to see it myself. And when it's functional, it becomes enjoyable. It becomes yes. easy. It just flows with it. So whether it's having my gym bag ready, whether it's having meals or my supplements or just the towels ready over the rack, just it's the simple things that yes. make my day enjoyable. And I've realized that that has turned all of my my entire life to become more enjoyable and and peaceful. And it's not controlling. It's it's really just keep it joys and energy, right? Mm-hmm. It's that fulfillment. It's not controlling. I'm not trying to control. You're not trying to control things. You're you're flowing. And when you do that, you actually like. So here you are dieted down to the point where I would say 99.5% of the population could never understand. Yet you're enjoying the process. It's mm-hmm. it's it's just part of the game, right? Yeah. Uh, is it hard? Yes. Nobody said it was easy. Yeah. But Hard, why is hard bad? <laughs> it's not just, why is challenging bad? Yeah, why is being uncomfortable bad? Doing this, you it I would say nearly impossible to impossible if you aren't organized and you made things around you functional. I mean, at this yep. point, if I couldn't find certain things, I'd probably stop looking. If I couldn't yep. figure out where my food was or scale or yep. anything, I'd just stop. I mean, and that is dieted down. So imagine when you're trying to start or trying to figure sure. out the way and now you got difficult on top of your body not functioning the way it should. It's just a very it's it's like this sneaky thing that's gonna sabotage you. I, I can't wait to get some feedback from this episode if people tried the the practices that we said because it really does work. Yeah. And guess what? You'll be decluttered and ready to set your goals for the new year. <laughs> yeah. That's it for today's show. Our mission here is to create a shift in the planet. You can join us on this mission. Simply like, share, subscribe. Do you see how I have all these episodes strategically put out, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think Peggy's starting to figure it out now. Oh, he just doesn't randomly pick stuff up. Everything's coming together. As always, until next time, stay inspired. Stay inspired.